Naruto. It is time for my next Naruto video. Thanks for being patient or impatient. Uh, it's taken me more time than I expected to get this video ready, but it's gonna be a bit of a doozy. So, you know, we're here. <laughs> we're here. So this video will be covering the, oh golly, Akatsuki Suppression Mission Arc through Pain's Assault Arc. So that's volume 35, well, the end of 35, volume 36 through 48. We're gonna talk about Naruto. I do have a playlist that I'll link in the description that has my first three Naruto videos. The last one that I made is my favorite because it was my favorite section of the story so far. And now we're gonna, we're gonna talk about a good chunk of the story today. So starting with some much needed Shikamaru love because I do love this character and I did talk about him in the last arc, but wow. He has snuck up on me and I just, I love him so much. This section of the story starts off with a fight and the fight was incredible to watch. The teamwork between the group, the way the training played into how they strategize and communicate. And I really felt the gravity of fighting an immortal. How when you do things, it can feel straightforward, but then because of a simple cut on the face, he can step into a circle and shift the scales of the fight. I loved Shikamaru in this fight. The scene where Asuma is about to be killed and Shikamaru figured out how to stop him and forced him outside of the circle while maintaining the jitsu and then Asuma attacks. Shikamaru showed so much strength here. His teachability, his ability to work with a team, his strength and ingenuity, and this battle showed how in a battle, the scales can tip back and forth. And it can feel like you're going to win only for them to tip again and again. The tension in this fight was incredible. This scene is one of my favorite parts in the sequence. When we think Asuma has been killed, but then the perspective shifts and we realize that Asuma hit him. But then the perspective shifts again and we realize that we're still tied together and the immortal can still stab himself killing Asuma. The guilt Shikamaru feels when he realizes that his mentor sacrificed himself for them really struck me, followed by Asuma's beautiful final words to them all, and Shikamaru's grief. Again, some of the best moments in this series are the time that the characters are given to feel pain and loss in this brutal world. I loved seeing these characters in action, from Shikamaru throwing the chakra blades to pin them down by their shadows, then force his foes to fight each other. Meanwhile, Kakashi is sending lightning fists through Kakuzu and destroys one of his hearts. And I just wanna give a shout out to my patron, Novel Defender, who put together a ton of anime clips for me to watch some of these scenes in action because I loved watching the sequence where Kakashi took that hit, being the first person to survive it, then it looked like Kakashi was cut through only to find it was an illusion, and the anime music shifts as we cut to Shikamaru with the scroll. Shikamaru has become such a star character for me, from being someone that was just kind of in the blob of side characters that entered into fights and that were part of the larger scale thing but never really got mentioned into videos to being one of my top three favorite characters in the series. The way he strategizes to the nth degree. He's so smart, he's so clever, he's always thinking a million steps ahead. He's so teachable and desires so much to get better, to serve the people around him, to be a team player and to lead them well as well as really valuing the lives of the people that he's fighting with. But he thinks about every detail. He thinks about every move. He's always steps ahead of everyone else in every battle and won't let a single thing go to waste. Like the blood that, As that Asuma died to get, he will not let that go to waste. He will make sure that that is utilized. I love his character so much and I love the emphasis that he got at the beginning of this section, as well as Kakashi, who is also one of my top characters in the series. Kakashi, who is always giving to others, always sacrificing for his students, for the next generation. The scene where he jumps out in front of the attack in, in this arc, as well as doing it again in the pain arc, really showcases who he's chosen to be as a character. Much like Shikamaru, Kakashi has had such a great character arc from where, when we saw him in his flashback with his old friends, uh, the one who gave him the eye. We see how he's grown so much 
as as a person and as a leader and as someone who instills teamwork in others and would sacrifice himself for others. He learns from his past mistakes, he grows from them, and he does everything he can to shepherd the next generation into their role. Meanwhile, Naruto has learned that he can use a third clone to split his attention and be able to master this new technique that he's been learning. One line that really, really stood out to me. Now Sasuke and I can be equals when he first learned how to control this and combine that quote with his response to Yamato when he learns about, the, about wind not defeating fire, but to beat lightning, that's not what I meant. We're perfectly suited. Only wind can assist and magnify fire. This sweet kid won't give up his hope of one day fighting alongside his friend again. And we can just see how desperately he's hurting that his friend has chosen this other path and wanting to bring him back so that they can fight alongside each other again. Even after Sasuke said, they're not brothers, completely denied him, said, I've chosen another path, you're not my person anymore. <laughs> and Naruto still just will not give up. He wants to fight next to his brother, no matter what? So the conclusion of Naruto's training is that Team 7 has arrived. Wind style and water style equals the heart of the hurricane vortex. As the series goes on, I'm finding myself more interested in a lot of the side characters than I am in Naruto himself, but I will say that I really appreciate that Shikamaru wasn't sidelined when the protagonist walked into the room. Shikamaru stayed active by defending himself with a shadow pole, then showing off the ultimate trap he's had set up before the fight. Once again, highlighting how incredible of a strategizer he is. The line, that there is your grave. And the ending panel with Asuma over his shoulder as he gets the old lighter out to set it all to flames. It was just, it was such a beautiful conclusion. And the whole thing ending with Shikamaru visiting Asuma's wife and promising to be the role model that his mentor was to him. The line, I guess I've got some growing up to do. It's all just, it's such a beautiful end to this arc. It's the perfect conclusion to this sequence because we get to see the older generation sacrificing themselves for the younger generation, but then we see that younger generation then looking to the next generation and saying, I'm gonna be that same mentor to you. I'm gonna be to you what the last generation was to me, showing alongside, especially in the pain arc, but we've seen this throughout the entire series, showing the cycle of violence, of hatred, of abandonment, of war, and how that affects people and how that harms people so much. We're also on the other side seeing the cycle of family, of uh, resilience, of hope, of investing in each other and how that cycle too can continue and create something really beautiful. So after Naruto's initial attempt fails and he tries again with, and his clones are the ones that attack, but he ignores the clones and targets the lone Naruto. Except that Naruto has mixed himself in with the clones and he lands the hit and I love this scene so much. I didn't take note of this in the manga, but when I was watching the anime scene, Choji told him that he did a great job with his strategy. He's no Shikamaru, but still. And Naruto said, don't compare me with Shikamaru. That's just not fair. And I just really appreciate that camaraderie and acknowledgement of each other's skill and strength. I also loved Kakashi's speech where he says, the next generation will always surpass the previous one and take its place. Reinforcing all those themes that we've been talking about. There's a lot going on with Sasuke. One scene I really enjoyed was when Sasuke decided that he's done playing pet for Orochi. And now that he's stronger than him, he's decided to keep his body and in fact, take down Orochimaru. I think I called him Orochi, it's Orochimaru. I loved the line, it had to be the herdling. That's the only Uchiha you could handle. Sasuke is so insulted by the way Orochimaru looks down on his clan, the way he conducts himself and kills unabashedly, and he's done with it. Anyway, Sasuke gets swallowed into the universe inside Orochimaru, where the transference ritual happens, and my thought was, Aw oh, shucks, I guess Sasuke is getting taken over. But no, actually Sasuke absorbed Orochimaru himself. The scene was so effective in showing off Sasuke's strength, which had been established before, but now we see that the man who's trying to control him and use him for his own games was light work in how far Sasuke has come. So this guy, the guy with the glasses, I don't remember his name, he gives Naruto a book 
of info on the Akatsuki and then reveals that he's combined bodies with Orochimaru, making them one. But Orochimaru is trying to gain control over him and is just terrifying. And Sasuke collects his team. Jingo is my favorite so far because he's such a wild card. Another Sasuke scene I loved was his fight with Deidara. Between the bombs, Sasuke's lightning counteracting, or I guess deactivating the bombs by running the lightning blade through himself. We see two very well matched opponents, but one is crazed and the other is calm and strategic. And I loved the line. That's what annoys me about you the most. Both of you Uchiha boys. You think you're just so cool and those eyes make me sick, always judging me and my art. And his response, I couldn't possibly care less about what you want. I just want to know where Itachi is. And then turning off his ocular jutsu because he didn't view him as an actual threat. It's just so disrespectful and I love it so much. The conclusion of the battle was of course fantastic as well, but I do have a question. Deidara trained an eye to become immune to the Sharigan. So I just don't, I assume it's, I assume it's, I assume <laughs> it's through exposure. You know, he's just slowly been building up an, an immunity. Cool. It seems like the Shargan, and maybe I'm dumb, but it seems like the Shargan, it seems like this ocular jutsu is one of the most powerful things in this series. It's so overpowered. And so having a character just off screen, some nebulous training that allows them to just not be affected by it anymore seems like so wild to me. And I know it's such a small thing. I'm just asking, did I miss something? Because it seems like such a big deal to have just casually mentioned. But then again, I guess a lot of big deal things are just casually mentioned in the series. So maybe I should just move on. Okay, I wanna talk about Jiraiya. Now that we've gotten his backstory and we understand the prophecy that he was given, the journey of trying to find his destiny, only to realize that it may be someone else that he's meant to train up, then training Naruto and eventually realizing that it's him. It really adds so much weight to the fact that Jiraiya had to fight his previous apprentice as his final stand. The flashback was so good. How they met these three who were orphaned because of the war, and then he saw Nagato's Rinnegan. He decided to take them in. This quote really got me. By the time you're all grown up, everyone will be living in peace and prosperity. That's easy for you to say, but we've all lost our families. If there is to be peace, it should only come after they go through what we did. That's the true meaning of sharing pain, isn't it? This is a quote that hit hard when I was first reading it, but then when I was going over my notes to prepare for this video, now in retrospect, having finished the pain arc, hits so much harder. I was also going through my notes and I wrote down, the Rinnegan is the most developed jutsu known to us today, rumored to always appear when the world becomes corrupt, capable of being a godlike force of creation and an all obliterating instrument of destruction. So I will say, cause I do have some thoughts on how the pain arc concluded, it is good to see a, some distinct foreshadowing of the creation and destruction around this eye. I'm gonna read one more quote though because a lot of these quotes in this arc and this section of the story just really hit hard. This is Jiraiya confronting Yahiko, but it's because no one understands such pain that generosity towards others becomes second nature. This is what it means to be human. His response, I just want to protect them no matter how much pain befalls me. Oh, I also love the quote. I'm sorry, I wrote down so many quotes for this section of the story. I also love the quote when Jiraiya uh, asked Nagato uh, what happened to the old him and he says, nothing, just war. Okay, so we've added all of this depth to Jiraiya, which means that it's time for the series to take him from us. The fact that he could have tried to escape, but he chose to stay behind and get the intel that they needed. And even though it seemed like he had been defeated and his sacrifice would be worthless, through sheer force of will, he fought to deliver that final message to Naruto. Jiraiya has been training up and fighting for people for so long in this war. And he dies thinking about his failures. He couldn't save his students, couldn't get the girl, couldn't defeat pain, couldn't save the world, but he was wrong. He fought to follow his path 
And when it didn't lead him where he thought it would, he pivoted and invested in the next generation so that he could be the tool he was meant to be to better the world. Turning that a person is a tool in, in war narrative on its head. Every choice that he made was a tiny piece that changed the course these people's lives would take even to the very end with Nagato. Jiraiya's words influenced the final decision he made. There's something really inspiring about someone who wasn't the prophesized one, and in the end didn't see the impact that they made on the world, even considered themselves a failure, yet we on the outside can take a step back and see what a huge impact he had. He was flawed for sure, but that didn't stop him from helping the individual and helping the world. There's something that the reader can take away from a character like that. To know that the small choices we make may seem fruitless in the moment, but they're not. Even if we don't get to see the fruit, it grows. The scene of him dying, thinking about how Naruto was named after the main character of his book. It's a beautiful full circle, where this book was his accounting of his own tales and inspired the naming of the true prophesized one, who he got to train up and he didn't realize until the end that it did come to pass. What an excellent end to his story. Okay, let's talk about Sasuke and Itachi. I loved this fight, especially after watching it in the anime. The quick movements of the brothers trying to best each other, but because they were working with illusions, it made me feel like I was constantly two steps behind everything they did. And sprinkled into that fight, we got information that only escalates the tension even further. Like when Itachi explains to Sasuke that he's going blind as he tries to control the Nine-Tailed Spirit, and that Madra was the first man to tame the Nine-Tails with his eyes. That Madra took the eye of his twin brother, and then declares that Itachi is hoping to steal his brother's eyes too stall his blindness and surpass Madra and become the ultimate shinobi. The action only keeps escalating in this fight, with Sasuke's black flames, which looked incredible, but also kept Itachi on his toes through the rest of the fight. Between the flames that allowed Sasuke to create the perfect conditions for lightning, and using Orochimaru's moves, Itachi's trump card, this fight drug these two to their limits, and it was incredible to watch. And then the end. The final threat to take his eyes, the gentle touch, and the smile before falling to his death. It was an incredible moment, but it held a really different meaning just a few chapters later. He wasn't even fighting at his full strength. He wasn't trying to hurt him. He wasn't trying to hurt Sasuke all this time. He was just trying to protect his brother, who he couldn't bring himself to kill, all those years ago. It's so interesting to see Sasuke, who has been so stubborn and so set in his ways, nothing, not even his friend who he considered like a brother, could change the path that he has chosen for himself to hunt down and kill his brother, to give justice to his fallen clan members. And when he goes through his fight with his brother and his brother dies and then everything gets turned on his head, it's so interesting to see how he changes in his resolve. Solve. And there's a lot of factors here. Um, you know, he values his clan so highly and getting this information about his brother from someone from his clan is naturally going to invoke a lot more trust in him than when Orochimaru is trying to give him information, for instance. But also, He's so vulnerable right now, you know, we're, we're all familiar with the concept that when you, when you allow your life to be driven by this need for vengeance, once you finally enact that vengeance, are you all better? Do you get healed? Is everything okay now? Has your life suddenly gotten its band-aids on it and you can move forward a happy-go-lucky person? Or are you still tormented? Did vengeance give you freedom? Or are you still hurting? And that's what we see in Sasuke, when he realizes what his brother fought for, when he, when he gets his whole history with his brother recontextualized, and he's still angry, and he's still violent, and he's still so hurting. And then we also get all this context around Madara, about him taking his brother's eyes not for greed or ambition, but to protect his clan. We learn that he did it to, he killed his brother to protect his clan. Meanwhile, um, Itachi killed his clan for a wider group of people, but couldn't bring himself to kill his brother. But then shortly after Madara killed his brother to become stronger, then a peace agreement is struck up and that just feels so unbearably unfair. 
Just another meaningless sacrifice of life for a stupid war. And then we get this whole history of mistrust and lies and planning a coup, more sacrifices for more <laughs> war. Now compare that with Itachi's story who watched so much death in this war that he ended up being a double agent against his own people. He was hurt and he was abandoned and he, and he was scared. So he turned on his own people for the wider good, but couldn't bring himself to kill his brother. I don't know if or when I will ever reread Naruto, but I really would just love to see all these Itachi scenes again and try to pick out all of the foreshadowing of Itachi's true motivations. And he's definitely not suddenly a morally good character in my eyes. He's not all of a sudden the hero of the story. He still feels very morally great to me because he still did so much to Sasuke and to others, but he's such a complicated character and this twist of expectations, this twist of perspective really just has my head spinning, desperately wanting to re analyze every scene that came before it to figure out how I how I'm supposed to view and understand this character. Okay, let's talk about Itachi's scene with Naruto. He asked Naruto what he would do if Sasuke went down an even darker path, and Naruto's answer was very childlike. I wouldn't make a decision. I would defend my village, and I'd also stop Sasuke without killing him. It's far too optimistic, and in war, sometimes you don't get to save everyone. But I understand why it was enough for Itachi. He just wants to know someone will keep fighting for his brother. That's all he wants. And Naruto is absolutely the one to never give up on Sasuke. So he gave Naruto some of his power to help him do just that. And I loved what came next. Shikamaru letting Naruto grieve while also helping pull him out of his spiral. Having lost a teacher too, I know what you're going through, but whining and sulking isn't going to make things better. We no longer have the luxury of grief. My teacher imparted in me a lot of knowledge, not just important things, but worthless things too. The same for you, right? An infinite number of priceless things. So I think it's about time for us to step up, no? To switch from being the imparted and become the imparter. It's a bother for sure, but we can't keep complaining. Relating to him, but pushing him to stand back up and fight for the next generation and showing Naruto Asuma's life and child and that he'll be protecting him and mentoring the child. He's so good and so good to Naruto to make sure that he kept perspective in the midst of his pain. Then we launch into the coded message, uh, figuring out what Jiraiya was trying to tell them in his last moments. And I, have nitpicky. I don't love this. I realize that these books are incredibly important to Jiraiya and also that Jiraiya is a master shinobi and him having memorized certain code, realizing that he may have to speak in code at some point, and so memorizing the first word on every page of every single book that he's written would feel kind of like a stretch if he weren't a master ninja and probably has trained for things like this and, and would want to have a secret code uh, memorized. Naturally, Jiraiya doesn't know what his final code has to be in his dying breaths. So this is something that he would have had to pour a lot of time into. I would just think that you might have told someone that, hey, if I ever need to send you a coded message, like a trusted someone, someone that he, someone like, like, to Sunde, uh, Tsunade, Sun someone like Tsunade, who he cares about and trusts deeply, and say, hey, if I ever need to get a message to you, here's how you would, here's how you would decode this. Or Naruto, his apprentice, or something like that. So we could still, if you want to spend some time decoding the message, we could still have some characters trying to figure it out, but then they finally ask the one person that Jiraiya trusted, and that one person says, I know the code, because he and I set this up beforehand just in case. I don't know, the way it was done just felt a little bit too convoluted to me. And I know it seems like a nitpick, but I've been gushing a lot, so allow me an occasional nitpick. Like I said before, Naruto's plotline is pretty up and down for me at the moment, but he's shining in his emotions of love and grief. The scenes of him reading Jiraiya's old stories about Naruto and how the two Narutos par parallel each other, it was a beautiful scene. Or when Naruto realized that he can't use sage mode but remembers Jiraiya's message and refuses to give up. Now let's talk about Kakashi more. The epic fight 
between so many characters against these monsters as they wait for Naruto to return was excellent, but the one that affected me the most was Kakashi. The fake out with Kakashi followed by his body disappearing, and then I saw him hiding in the rubble, and then he came up from the ground. I just love to watch him fight. But the panel of Kakashi getting a nail through the head, it was so beautifully done. And let me tell you, I mourned his death. He kept fighting while he was dying. He stopped one of Pain's attacks before he died. We're at war, people die, but Kakashi died to give Choji a chance to get away and relay important information. And after everything Kakashi has done, once again, he is a character that sacrifices himself for the next generation. And I just love him so much. And the scene with Kakashi reuniting with his dad in the afterlife, it was just the perfect death scene. And then this, <laughs> after all the fighting, after all these people refusing to stop fighting and putting all their trust in Naruto, pain accomplishes the unthinkable and the loss is huge. Speaking of Naruto scenes that land in this arc, one of my favorite scenes is after Naruto arrives to fight and says, I'm able to sense everyone's chakra. Is Master Kakashi on a mission away from the village? He won't look at her when he asks the question, and I can just feel how tense and solemn he is while he's asking. He knows the answer, but he won't ask outright. So when he's met with silence, his quiet, okay, and then he just starts defending against the attacks. I cried while reading this. It was so powerful. He's now lost two mentors back to back, and he's in so much pain, but he still carries on. The action in the sequence was incredible, but the emotion that backed it is what made the sequence even more epic. Much like the fight between Itachi and Sasuke, Naruto and Pain push each other to their limits. But they realize that Pain must be controlled from the highest point in the village, and they try to track that down. The conversation between Pain and Naruto is just so good. Pain suggesting that the destruction that they want to bring will fulfill Jiraiya's dreams of peace. I loved Naruto's response. You killed my master and my teacher, hurt my friends, destroyed my village. You dare to say peace after all you've done? And then Pain turning it back around on him. What about my family, my friends, my village? Is it fair that you shinobi who once did the same to me as I have now done to you be allowed to spout all of this drivel about peace and justice? Once again, an emphasis on the effects of war. I love that the tables turned on Naruto here, seeing that war isn't just horrible for him and those he loves, but that his side has displaced and killed many as well. And if one calls vengeance justice, such justice will just breed further vengeance. Then he asked Naruto how he would confront this hatred to create peace, and Naruto realized that he didn't know. This speech was incredible, not just in content, but in the fact that he was able to crack Naruto's hope and overcome him in his impassioned speech. Pain didn't just match Naruto physically, but he was able to overpower his hope. He was able to shed a light on the flaws in Naruto's perspective and shift his worldview. The bringer of hope in this series, the one that's been able to relate to people and relate to their pain and show them a new way, now someone is relating to Naruto's pain and show him a new way but it's a path of hopelessness instead of a path of hope. And it nearly ruined him. A lot happens here, but I wanna to hop to a scene that I have very mixed feelings about, which is when Naruto goes into eight tail form and then goes directly to the fox spirit for help. And the fox spirit once again begs to be left out and Naruto almost does it. Naruto was this close to letting the fox spirit out because he was so overwhelmed and confused about what to do and what a perfect time for his dad to show up. Okay, so Naruto's dad is the fourth Hokage and I'm 
probably stupid because I probably should have figured this out sooner. And I do love the conversation that happens here in the midst of Naruto's vulnerability. I love the perspective that love and hate are a part of life, but that he has to stop the hate before it turns into pain and suffering. But I also have many questions after this sequence. Now, admittedly, I have a very bad memory, so it's possible that I'm forgetting some of the early details from the series, so maybe you can help me out, help me understand this a little bit better. But this sort of perspective of, I trapped a demon in you because you're my son and I knew you could handle it, is like, it's... It doesn't make me like him more. I get that the village was in danger and that war can cause people to make, to go to extreme measures for the sake of the greater good, that, that impulsive bad decisions can be made. A lot of things. We could have a lot of discussion around this, but I'm gonna need a lot more explanation on this one to feel settled by this decision that was made. Especially because if he truly was the fourth Hokage's son and looks just like him, so one would think that people would know that this is the fourth Hokage's son and that the fourth Hokage did this believing this is my son, so he's gonna be a hero at the end of all this, then why was he treated the way he was? Why was he not protected more? Why was his legacy that was expected of him not portrayed to people? Am I dumb? Did I forget some really important detail here? Because Naruto seems to have found closure in this whole conversation, even calling, even like, I think he cried and, and, and called his dad Pa, like a very affectionate term of endearment and he just he seems he seems to have gotten all the closure in this and I don't feel like I did. The end of Naruto's battle with pain was fantastic and I realize that this is an annoying trait of mine but once again I have to focus on the emotional impact of this scene because Naruto recalling his two mentors and now his dad how they believed in him and that overpowers the hopelessness that pain gave him and gives him the strength to keep fighting. And couple that with the greatest offense that Naruto took from this fight was that Pain tried to make him give up, almost made him forsake his shinobi way. It was incredible. This whole Pain sequence was one of the best fights in the series for me, not because of the action, but because of the emotional and psychological impact it had on Naruto. Now let's talk about Naruto and Nagato. It's important for us to see Nagato's flashback we need to see in action what Pain was saying, that there are no winners at war because no matter what, innocents die. Nagato's parents were killed by the Leaf Village and once again, a child was left behind to suffer, to starve along with everyone else. Thankfully, he got a found family that saved him and a mentor that raised him up, but were once again reminded of all the collateral damage on the innocents but Nagato was put in an impossible situation to kill Yahiko or sacrifice Conan. But Yahiko killed himself so Nagato wouldn't have to live with the choice. This destroyed his hope for the opposing sides working together at peace. Peace would never come by agreement. It had to come by force. Peace without casualties was an impossibility. That's what humanity had taught him around every corner. And that's what he learned through his experiences. So Jiraiya's lofty, hopeful idea of a future was something that he couldn't believe in anymore. Okay, so I know I'm gonna get some pushback about my little nitpick for Jiraiya's book. I know I'm gonna get a lot of pushback for this part, but I didn't love the way this ended. Actually, I hated the way this ended. I, I really didn't like it. First of all, let me talk about how it makes sense thematically because I really try to engage with the story even in scenes and choices that I personally don't care for. I really try to engage with the story in the way that it's, in the story that it's trying to tell, the things that it's trying to do. So let me talk about how it works thematically before I get into my opinions. Naruto convinces Nagato to change his mind and he does it by using Jiraiya's book. This is an incredible full circle moment, especially because it reminds us that Jiraiya did have impact. He wasn't a failure, that to the very end, it was his words, his teaching, his influence that turned the tables and saved so many people. 
For me, this is a great example of a story choice working really well thematically, but not in application. This is the first time that Naruto's idealism was truly challenged, and he realized that he didn't have an answer. This was Naruto having to reckon with the true pain that the world is experiencing, and not just himself and his village, not just the people that he cares about and he's fighting for, but the whole world. And having to reckon with the fact that his side participated in that pain too. It's him having his ideals challenged and really having to decide if this is something that he can still fight for. Pain challenged him and he was shaken, but he still stood strong. He still exemplified that resilience and that hope and that the fact that you do get to choose your own path. And thematically, Nagato breaking that cycle and sacrificing himself for a new path, for the world's greater good, is great. Not to mention that it ends on Naruto being celebrated by his people, his dream from chapter one being accomplished where he's embraced and loved and hoisted on their shoulders and celebrated among his own. It's beautiful. But I have two problems. My smaller problem is that it was quite fast. Um, even though there's a lot of context around this and hopefully I've done a decent job of citing some of that context, it's still, while reading it, felt very fast. Like Naruto quoted from Jiraiya's book and then Pain changed his whole perspective. And again, lots of context around it, but it still felt, while I was reading it, so abrupt. I wasn't able to keep believing in Jiraiya, or even in myself, but you give me a vision for the future that shows a different path from the one I've walked. I think I shall believe in you, Uzumaki Naruto. Don't get me wrong, the book reminded him of Jaira's old teachings, reminded him that he was supposed to be the one that the books were talking about, that Jiraiya believed it was supposed to be him that would bring forth this prophecy, that would bring forth this new promising future. So he was reminded of Jiraiya believing in him. He was reminded of his old teachings, all of those things, all of the context. Plus, I understand being confronted with the path that you once walked and you once believed in and seeing someone standing before you who is the embodiment of that path and who has fought for that path, believed in it, and chosen to stick with it even in the most dire of times and how that could shake you. But I would like, I would prefer a shaking as opposed to like a heel turn. He just killed so many people. <laughs> he was just responsible for the slaughter of so many. And I would have loved to see him wrestle with it a, a little bit more. I would have loved to see him kind of crack and break and, and, and kind of be tormented by the fact that maybe he chose the wrong path. Maybe he was wrong. Maybe there is hope. And if that's the case, what have I done? Look at the effects I've had on the world. Look at how I've perpetuated the cycle, caused more orphans, more harm, more death, more pain. I would love to see him wrestle with that for at least one chapter, one full chapter of him just being tormented by the reality of what he's done before he makes the big change. But even with all that, my larger problem, that's my minor problem, my larger problem is the mass resurrection. <laughs> Y'all know I don't like the resurrection trope. And in my last Naruto video, I loved the Gara resurrection. This was an example of a resurrection done well, and I even got some flack in the comments because I constantly harp on hating the resurrection trope and then in this one I said it was good and people were like, oh, so when Naruto does it, no, because this is an example of me hating it. I just really, really loved the way it worked in the story that time, but this time, oh my goodness. <laughs> Here's the thing, he just slaughtered so many people. I want him to have to reckon with that. I want him to have to deal with the consequences of that. I don't love the abruptness of Nagato's change, but I also understand that this is a hopeful series and that it's not trying to be a tragedy and people and systems are going to change. That's just what this story is doing. So let him change, but also let him live with it. Make him have to sit with it and spend his life trying to make amends for the harm that he's caused, devoting his life to, un to undoing the pain, even though you can't undo it. You can't press a button or, or you know, enact your, <laughs> your will. Let him wrestle with it and spend the rest of his life trying to make amends for the harm that he's caused to so many, trying to devote his life to making the world better after he's caused so much pain. To me, that's a much more impactful story than 
uh, self-sacrifice that resurrects everybody. It's like pushing the undo button, and narratively, it was so unsatisfying to me. It doesn't really feel like punishment or redemption to me. It just kind of feels like he didn't have to actually live with the consequences of what he had done. And especially with scenes like Kakashi, which I think was the perfect death sequence, then just undoing it, along with so many other deaths, takes a lot of the oomph out of that scene now on reflection. Like, I don't feel it as hard anymore because, you know, we're all just gonna move on. And the thing is, looking forward, I don't expect Sasuke to be a tragic story either. I expect Naruto to win him over and for them to be able to move forward as friends, fighting alongside each other on a better, better path. I could be wrong, but because this is a very hopeful story and because this has been Naruto's number one goal, I don't expect him not to accomplish his goal. So since Sasuke is going to have a redemption arc, I assume, I would just love to explore having to live with the consequences of a life down the wrong path through Nagato and live with trying to make the world better from here forward, trying to make up for what you've done the, the best way you possibly can. I know people are gonna hate my take on this. I'm aware of this, <laughs> but this is my take. This is the way, this is the way I feel about it. And I try really hard when analyzing a series not to project, this is what I wanted the series to do, but rather to engage with what it was trying to do. So please accept this compromise where I did try to engage with what the series was trying to do. That was what I started with my analysis of the scene, but then also talked about why it didn't land for me and what I would have preferred to see it do. The good news is that I enjoyed this stretch overall very much with, with a few complaints. And I will continue reading through the end of part two. My plan is to come back when I'm done with the last bit of part two, with the last half of part two, uh, in another one long monster video. We'll see if that works out. I might decide to split it up. We'll just see how I feel as I'm reading it. I will see you again soon. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>